Good evening. Glad to see everyone out with us this evening. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad that you're here. And if you would, please take a visitor's card and on your way out, just put it on the table in the back. We'll be meeting at 9 o'clock Sunday morning for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship service, and then again at 5 o'clock Sunday evening. Please join us at every opportunity that you can. It's good to see David uh, Robinson out with us today. David said he had a, an, an okay day today, which is always good news. Also remember Bobby Job. This is Lillian Campbell's brother. He's going to be having open heart surgery at Huntsville Hospital, and uh, it could be kind of a risky surgery, so let's uh, keep Lillian and uh, Bobby in our prayers as well. Ladies Helping Hands, remember you're meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock at the home of Joy Marshall. The uh, family seminar is going to be Saturday, June 16th. That's a VBS-style classes in the morning and then a uh, youth devo sort of thing in the afternoon. The new part of that announcement is that Pat Bradford would like to meet with all the VBS teachers this Sunday morning after worship. So if you're a teacher for the VBS on June 16th, please meet with Pat Bradford. Continue to remember the Honduras Collection and the annual Christian Golf Challenge Tournament that's also going to be on June 16th. The Summer Bible Series continues Monday night if we can find someone to host it. Uh, there's a, there is a sign-up list out in the, uh, out in the, uh, by the Secretary's office, and there, there are several nights open uh, throughout the summer. If you could host that, uh, please sign up uh, quickly. If you have any questions about that, please see uh, Lonnie or Jackie Jones or there's several other people who can kind of give you some information on that. The Song of Invitation tonight is number 29, number 29, and Chuck Helms will lead our closing prayer, and we'll turn it over to Brady White. If you would like to go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Peter, we'll be reading from there in just a moment. <clears throat> Pat Riley, the team president of the Miami Heat and former NBA coach once said, when a great team loses through complacency, it will constantly search for new and more intricate explanations to explain away defeat. I want to focus on one word in this quote in particular, complacency. Complacency is defined as self-satisfaction especially when accompanied by unawareness of actual dangers or deficiencies. You see, complacency is a very troublesome word, not only in sports, but in everyday life. <clears throat> As many of you here tonight know, I attend the University of Alabama, and I've been yelling roll tide ever since the day I started talking. So for those who keep track of college football, you may understand why the 2010 season was a bit of a disappointment for me. Coming off of a national championship and a perfect 14-0 record, the Crimson Tide football team was poised and ready for a repeat. Coach Saban knew he had to do everything he could to keep those boys focused. The fans and the media, they all believed that this team in 2010 was better than the one that went undefeated in 2009. The media even picked them as the preseason favorite to win the national title. Unfortunately, they finished with a 10-3 record with no national championship to show. Some may wonder, what exactly happened to that football team? This is a direct relation to the word I mentioned earlier, complacency. Coming off of that national championship, the team knew they were as good, if not better, than the team that took the field in 09. They felt a sense of entitlement and were basically just comfortable with what they had. South Carolina, LSU, and Auburn all saw this weakness and managed to turn that weakness into a defeat. The same thing can happen in our Christian lives except our goal is much, much better than a crystal football, and our enemy is much worse than the likes of an SEC defense. Now to 1 Peter. In 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, it reads, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. What Peter's telling us here is not to be lazy and don't ever get comfortable with where we are because the devil is always out there, just waiting for us to get lazy and devour us. He wants us all to stand firm in our faith to the Lord, because we all know that we are not alone in our struggles. This next story should illustrate that it is always in our best interest to help others with their struggles, and it also emphasizes the danger of complacency. A mouse looked through a crack in the wall to see a farmer and his wife opening a package. What food might this contain, the mouse thought. He was devastated to discover that this was a mouse trap. Retre retreating to the farmyard, the mouse proclaimed the warning, there's a mouse trap in the house, there's a mouse trap in the house. The chicken clucked and scratched and raised her head and said, 
Mr. Mouse, I can tell this is a grave concern to you, but it is, it is of no consequence to me. Therefore, I cannot be bothered by it. The mouse turned to the pig and said, Mr. Pig, there's a mouse trap in the house. The pig sympathized and said, I'm so very sorry, Mr. Mouse, but there is nothing I can do about it but pray. Be assured that you're in my prayers. The mouse turned to the cow and said, Cow, there's a mouse trap in the house. She said, Wow, Mr. Mouse, I'm sorry for you, but it's no skin off my nose. So the mouse returned to the house, head down and dejected, to face the mouse trap all by himself. That very night, a sound was heard throughout the house like a sound of a mouse trap catching its prey. The farmer's wife rushed to see what was caught, and in the darkness, she did not notice that it was a venomous snake with its tail caught in the trap. The snake bit the farmer's wife. The farmer rushed her to the hospital. She returned home with a fever. Now everyone knows you treat a fever with fresh chicken soup. So the farmer took his hedges to the farmyard for the soup's main ingredient. But his wife's sickness continued, so friends and neighbors came to sit with her around the clock. To feed them, the farmer butchered the pig. The farmer's wife did not get well. She died. And so many people came to her funeral, the farmer had the cow slaughtered to provide enough meat for all of them. So next time, if you hear of someone is facing a problem and think that it doesn't concern you, remember that when one of us is at risk, it puts all of us at risk. In the book of Revelation, God has a strong reaction to a complacent attitude about a relationship with him, which is shown in Revelations 3, 14 through 18. Turn there. He says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. This book also shows God's keen interest in maintaining a viable, strong, and vibrant relationship between him and his people today, which is shown in Revelation 2, 1 through 5. He says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. For God, the relationship he desires to have with us is always the, his first importance. He sent his son to suffer, die, be raised from the dead, to reestablish a relationship with him that was broken by sin. His son now reigns at his right hand to affect that relationship when we are reunited with him on that joyful day. I want to end tonight on a list that is titled The Nine Things God Won't Ask You on That Day. God won't ask what kind of car you drove. He'll ask you how many people you drove that didn't have transportation. God won't ask the square footage of your house. He'll ask how many people that you welcomed into your home. God won't ask you about the clothes in your closet. He'll ask you how many people you helped clothe. God won't ask what your highest salary was. He'll ask if you compromised your character to obtain it. God won't ask what your job title was. He'll ask if you performed your job to the best of your ability. God won't ask how many friends you had. He'll ask how many people to whom you were a friend. God won't ask in what neighborhood you lived. He'll ask how you treated your neighbors. God won't ask about the color of your skin. He'll ask about the content of your character. And finally, God won't ask you why it took you so long to seek salvation. He will lovingly take you to your mansion in heaven and not to the gates of hell. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, it is very easy to become complacent with the rush of schedules and importance of social things such as jobs, schools, popularity. Sadly, however, a personal relationship with God just gradually gets pushed farther aside day by day 
What was once important becomes of no importance, and what used to be first has now become last. Tonight, if you've made what was first become last, or if you've never confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and put him on through baptism, we all encourage you to walk down this aisle. At the end of your road, will you look back and think that you were complacent, or will you say as Paul did in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the play, the faith. Please come now while we stand and sing. closing hymn in a moment, 250, we'll have our closing prayer after this. Let me give you a couple other items to think about this week. You might want to bring Sunday for the Honduras mission trip. Uh, two specials of the week would be allergy medicines, Claritin or Sudafed, something like that. And then also children's shoes of all sizes, either new or gently used. <clears throat> Do the first and the last of this, please. <clears throat> How sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord day you've given us lord all the many blessings in life thank you for your health your home and the food you provide us with thank you lord for brother tim brother lonnie and their families lord thank you for our elders and our deacons thank you for the jobs that they all do lord bless each and every member here and keep, always keep them safe dear lord on our upcoming mission trip take care of these folks and bring them back safe and let's accomplish a good goal also lord say a special prayer for ones that are sick and overlook them and the physicians taking care of them and make them well again lord thank you for everything you've given us bring us back to the next appointed time lord amen <clears throat> 